thank you guys for joining. Um, thank you for all of you for joining, everybody that's uh, tuning in. So I'm Jen Kellogg, Contour Business Basics. We're gonna talk about routing. Um, Tuesday, and now posted on YouTube, is kind of a more of a lecture style, step-by-step, -step, things to think about when you're doing, uh, putting together a routing or what people are thinking about when they are doing that. And so today I wanted to have some actual professionals who live and breathe <laughs> road life uh either living on that route on a tour bus or putting it together um for the artists and the crew um so let's kind of one by one introduce uh let's start with jim and then we'll do adam and then dave hi i'm jim <laughs> what do you do why did i like, oh, sorry. Did it about yourself uh, I'm a production, well, I was before COVID a production manager. Um, I had uh, Lincoln Park for the last 16 years or uh, more than that now since, since their uh, first Project Rev tour, so 2002. Um, and I had Marilyn Manson as a client and uh, Hootie and the Blowfish. And I go back a long way. I hide, this, I hide the gray hair by cutting it all off. I um, need to get back to that, but yeah. So uh, yeah, that's what I do. I, I receive the routing. <laughs> and we will, get to, we will get to opinions that uh, us roadies have when we receive a routing later in our discussion. The more challenging, the better, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adam. Uh, Adam Weiser, I work for AG Global Touring uh, in Nashville. Uh, I oversee touring for our artists here, which include Everything from Luke Combs to Dan and Shay, uh, Lauren Daigle, who's a, a Christian artist, uh, My Chemical Romance, uh, Kane Brown, Kelsey Ballerini. Yeah, so um, my role in it is to work with the agent uh, to uh, essentially facilitate between agent, venue, tour manager, production manager, uh, everything that the promoter side has to do for a tour. So, awesome. And I'm the one who writes a check. <laughs> Dave, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for ha having me. Um, yeah, so I've been an agent for about 17 years now. I spent most of that time at major agencies, um, spent 10 years at the agency group before the agency group was acquired by UTA, where I then spent about three and a half years, where then me and two of my colleagues at UTA uh, decided that we were not cut out for corporate America and left and took our roster with us and uh, started Sound Talent Group, which is the agency that I co-founded with those two friends of mine and that I still run today, uh, if you can call it that in today's world. <laughs> Who knows what the hell we're all doing right now. But, um, yeah. you know, but yeah, so uh, I, I co-own and and, and help run a sound talent group while also managing my own roster of artists. Um, and then in addition to that, I've, you know, kind of always had my hand in a lot of different things around the music business. Uh, I own Velocity Records, who, which signed and broke Paris and Issues in a bunch of bands. And, uh, you know, I've yeah done all sorts of stuff over the years in, in the business. So uh, that's, yeah. That, that, that's I missed me. the best part. You are also a famous rock star. <laughs> what? Come on. Definitely not. Definitely not. Is that not. where the airplanes came from? <laughs> not a famous rock star. I'll send I everybody was, a link. I send everybody a, a link to music. I was in a band that, uh, that funny enough, like, it must, like, I was super early in my career, obviously. I was like 18 when we started touring. And Adam must have been really just getting started in his promoting career. And yeah. my band was from upstate New York and he was down in Long Island and he would promote my band shows like all the time. And we got to know each other. Yeah, it must've been, I guess, 19, 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, two, probably 2003, yeah, so. Yeah. So for context, Dave, um, I mean, I described you to the other uh, panelists in email as the art uh, agent to literally all of the warp Tour bands. Um, but <laughs> it, you mentioned a couple, but can you just, uh, for context, who are some of the other artists on your roster? Sure, yeah. So, um, well, the nice thing is, you know, now that we have left UTA, UTA and, um, 
you know, that I'm one of the owners here at the agency, you know, really try to help everyone, no matter what bands any agent of the company represents. So the company as a whole, we, we have a pretty wide range. Uh-oh. Oh, Damn, no. I, so, yeah, the company as a whole, get, you know, we've got everything from some of the biggest Latin artists like Natalia Lopricot or Zoe, who won a Grammy last year or, you know, any of that stuff. But then we also do have, yeah, like I personally handle a lot of, you know, yeah, the, the rock and hard rock and metal stuff, whether it's um, Parkway Drive or August Burns Red. Um, or, you know, Wonder Years, or, um, you know, Animals as Leaders, uh, I Prevail, Pierce the Veil, you know, and then, you know, some other stuff as well, uh, Hanson, and a bunch of different things. We rep run DMC as a company, you know, the, the roster's all over the place, Lamb of God, um, you name it, so... When I was in college, our like big finale show, my senior year, we did an outdoor festival with Run DMC and it was like the best day of my life. <laughs> That's awesome. Being involved in putting that on, yeah. Um, awesome, so let's start kind of at the beginning um, with Dave, can you kind of talk a little bit about an artist, is, you're, you're deciding it's time for an artist to go on tour and we don't have to get into that decision process right now, um, but, all right, so the tour is going to kind of be happening. You kind of know the time frame. What big picture strategy are you looking at? Are you looking, you know, how do you kind of figure out where to start the tour? How long should it be? How far out are you working on this process? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I want to give the caveat. I kind of said this half joking before, but in all honesty, like every everything, all the information I'm going to give is based on kind of the old world. And, uh, you know, things sure. are changing a lot right now and everything i say right now may not matter at all when we come back i mean we're we're really uh trying to pivot in the moment and i think everyone in this call is trying to deal with that i know for a fact adam is because i've been talking to tons of people at his company all day every day um in touring and otherwise and you know um so the point is you know i think it's a, a I'm sure there will be takeaways of what we've been doing into the future, but things are changing. For sure. And um, I plan to kind of jump on that topic a little bit later on when we start about talking about traffic in the market and trying to rebook everything on top of everything else. So yes, thank you for mentioning that up front. And I cool. got questions about that too. I want to know where, where he's going. <laughs> and, and I'll give you the equally speculative answers that every other person has. I was like, we'll give you the, we'll give you today's answer. But yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And hold yeah. on for another twenty-four hours. Yeah. yeah exactly. let's, pre yeah. let's pretend we are in a non-COVID situation, and it's just yeah. like normal land. And uh, we're going to approach most of the conversation, I think, from that point, so that people can have a base understanding of how the industry did function and do this, and then we'll kind of. Uh, pick away of what might change. Cool, yeah, that sounds good. So yeah, typically when I'm first starting a Ratator and trying to decide where we're gonna go and what we're gonna do, um, my strategy with artists that I always tell them is that whatever we're, we're booking, we shouldn't be thinking about what we're booking right now, we should be thinking about the next booking. So like every booking we make, the idea is how will it affect the next time in that market? Right. So, um, so when we start to put ratings together, there's a lot of those questions that we ask. In other words, maybe a band is currently able to sell out thousand seaters and we want the next tour to be 2000 seaters. Well, what do we have to do on this tour in order to get us to that point on the next tour? Right. Or maybe our goal is to become more of a festival band. And what do we have to do on this tour to get more on the festival's radars? For the next tour and so on and so forth so it's always about a long-term play and never really looking at that particular routing um of course we get granular in that particular routing but always with the mindset of how is this going to affect the career and the trajectory of the band in one two three five and ten years mm -hmm. and and really if you can do that that's that's where you try to help build and develop careers um, you know, and you don't always get it right, you know, but, but 
you know, we do our best to be smart about the decisions we make and, and try to get it right. So um, I'll give you just a couple quick examples, but, you know, let's say for that example, we're a band that can consistently sell out thousand seaters have never made that leap to 2000 seaters. What are we going to do on this tour to set us up to finally take that leap? Well, maybe we're going to go into rooms slightly smaller this time because we'll turn more people away, build up that demand a little more. And then maybe we'll talk about taking a year off to also build the demand and think about the next time we're going to come through. If we know financially the band can't afford to take a year off, okay, well then how else can we figure out how to build demand and build that strategy up? Maybe we don't play the majors. Maybe we only play secondaries and play smaller there in order to also turn people away from those shows, forcing them to drive to the majors when we come back into the majors six months later, right? So, you know, these are just random examples, but there's all different ways to think on that. Maybe, like I was saying for another example, like maybe the festival example, right? Like maybe you're a band that like, you know, you're on the up and up, you know, festivals aren't paying attention. And that seems to be like your next big play is like, we want to be a big festival band. We know we can win those fans over. That'll be the next big step. Well, maybe in LA, the right room is to play the Palladium because it's 3,500 cap. It's the perfect capacity. There's no other capacity in that market that's similar to that. Well, maybe we should go play the Shrine and we'll maybe do 3,500 tickets in a 5,000 seater, but AEG books the Shrine and now we can kind of say to them, listen, like you're our promoter in LA. We want your help with Coachella. Doesn't mean you'll get it, but at least you're starting to bridge that gap, right? So like, you know, um, all of those things, just all of those thoughts about what are we going to do for the long-term play. That's like always the thought is the next show, not the one you're booking right now. Dave, is there, is there a magic formula for when a tour launches, a new tour cycle launches around the release of an album? Does that, does, how do those two things play together? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, for sure, yeah, I think that, uh, it, it depends. It's really genre specific these days. That has changed a lot. Before you lived and died by the album cycle. You know, now, you know, bands and artists are releasing singles and they're not releasing albums as often and so on and so forth. But a lot of the albums or artists we represent are still very album centric. Um, you know, and it's continuing to change more and more over time. But, you know, we absolutely do still plan a lot around albums. It's also dependent on how long the artist has been around and the type of artist they are. Um, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, this is a great example. I don't represent them. This is just a random example. M my favorite band is Iron Maiden, right? And um, I always tell people I only go to shows for two reasons. If I work with the band or if it's Iron Maiden, that's it. Like, cause I go to shows like every other night of the week. And after a while you want some nights at home. So like, um, but the point is, like, as a longtime Iron Maiden fan, they're a band that's been around a really long time. I don't care if they have a new record or not. I'm going to go see them, right? Like, right. they're an older right. band. Like, as much as I love them, like, I'm not really counting the days for a new Maiden record. Like, they have their staples that I'm, like, will always be obsessed with. And so the point is, like, I think that when you're also a younger band and it's your second, third, fourth album, it's a lot different than, like, you know, going – on the Warp Tour kind of world example, since I do represent a lot of those bands, like Less Than Jake's a band that I've represented for a long time. Like, I don't think that we really need to plan Less Than Jake's touring around an album cycle as, as much as we do for a band like I Prevail, who's currently super hot at radio and it, you know, they've only got a couple records out and like, you know, it, 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 like, it's just a very different approach. So I think it's really case by case, but, um, album cycles can be very important to a lot of bands. Um, so that was a great question. I, uh, I think that we see more artists now that have had time to build that length of career where they have a fan base that is willing to come out and see them every summer in the amphitheater. You know, the 
311 and Jimmy Buffett and uh -huh. you know, there are and Less Than Jake I think is a great example of a band that has had a long career plays you know it's, they're not trying to get to an arena level but they are able to have a very sustainable career um, and people will go see them uh, time and time again for a band like that how frequently do you have them playing a, a major market well, <clears throat> for a band like that, I find a lot of times it's about strength and numbers and about the package. And I think Adam can really attest to this because, you know, w we sell a lot of these different tours, of course, to AG and do a lot of business with them on this. And for a band like Less Than Jake, for example, like, you know, <laughs> we've done Less Than Jake and Real Big Fish together more times than I can remember, but it works every time, you know, like. Uh, we did less than Jake and face to face a few years ago and the tour sold out everywhere, you know, like um, point is like a band like that can kind of come around as often as they need to, to make a living if the package is right. But if the package isn't right, it can make it really difficult. Um, it, well, and Adam, it, could you maybe jump on that? I have a good talent buyer friend in Chicago who always says to agents, we can't miss you if you don't ever go away when bands are wanting to come through too often. What's your perspective, Adam, on um, frequency? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, to what they've said, it is, especially when you're looking at some of what I'd say the heritage artists at this point, like not to put 90s and 2000s into heritage, but a Less Than Jake or a Real Big Fish or some, you know, an artist that, like you said, can play clubs every year and sustain a living. Um, you know, you saw the anniversary, the album anniversaries becoming uh, a constant thing because it changed up um, what they were doing every year. And I do think that the package was, it really does become meaningful um, to those artists that are making a living in clubs. Um, you know, Less Than Jake is a great example. I'd say when I booked Starline Ballroom, we probably had them every 18 months. Um, but you would see an ebb and flow in their business based off of what they were doing, were they doing an album? Did they have support? Did they just have local support? What is it that made it that this time I felt the need to go um, if, I, if I saw them a year or 18 months ago? Um, that really, that changes the dynamic of it. I've also seen ones where, you know, they've, they have come back too many times in a row and the, the business just dwindles. Um, as the album uh, tour became increasingly popular, we saw the show after the album tour flat a little bit, you know, the show would be a little bit flat because you just super served your fan with everything that they wanted to see because you played your biggest album in its entirety. And then you're coming back eight, 12, 16 months later, whatever it is with your regular show with no, no investment in support. Um, it just becomes less exciting. Um, that's, you know, so I would say that there's no real answer to that. Um, it just depends on how creative you can get. And again, it's all about sustainability for its career club acts are a thing um, and it's a, a very plentiful thing. Um, it's just about how you sustain it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you look at things, you look at bands like Hall & Oates who are out almost, I don't, I don't know about now, but they used to be out every year, every 18 months and they'd play the same, you know, Indian casinos and, and the theater halls across the country and they'd sell out. And a lot of times the same fans in the same room every night, uh, they're still doing great. And that's a 70s act, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that package they were doing with Squeeze this summer was, was on fire. Right? Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. So we kind of were talking about um, frequency that, that fans are, are willing to put out to their time and money to go to the same act. Let's talk a little bit about then kind of direct competition where, you know, on both the agent side where you're representing, Dave, a lot of fans that have a similar audience that are going to want to go to uh, multiples of these shows. And Adam, you're looking at as artists are coming through your market, you've got the same kind of fans that are going to want to go. Can you guys talk a little bit about traffic in the market and having too many things on top of each other that are going to kind of cannibalize each other. I mean, I'll just say quickly. So I've ventured into the world of country over the last five years. And I think that there's 
a really interesting dynamic in that world in that everybody communicates, right? Whether it's the other promoters, the agents, uh, competing agencies, venues, everybody really is transparent about what they're working on, which allows us to properly plan to say, okay, well, a major market arena probably shouldn't have more than two country shows a month. A secondary market arena probably shouldn't have one more than one a month or even every six weeks. Like just from a, an economical factor, from a marketing factor, all the different things. Um, so I would say that other genres in my career I have found are not as supportive of each other, but I would say, and not to go into a post COVID world, that in the last eight weeks, I've seen it across every genre, whether it's hip hop or rock or whatever it else, people figuring that exact thing out of like, well, we know that everybody's moving to 2021. How are we not on top of each other? How do we get more creative with packaging so that we're not on top of each other? You know, and because the dollar is gonna have that much more value um, coming out of this. I mean, Dave, any other, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, that's a constant struggle, right? Because bands need to tour, uh, you know, and you can't say to one band, well, you can't go on tour because all these other bands are on tour, right? Like if they got a tour, they got a tour. So um, the best thing you can do is work to build the best packages for them to increase the value for the fan and try to help sell those tickets. And then also like, you know, looking at the routings and getting creative and, you know, figuring out like, okay, like, uh, you know, if, if tour A is going to be going through Chicago on the 12th and tour B is looking to go through on the 15th, well, maybe I can flip the routing around a little bit and, and spread them apart a little more. Or maybe I can even move it to a Saturday and combine the shows and make it a special show. Um, or maybe one of these tours can skip the market, um, you know, depending on their situation. So, but I will say, honestly, more often than not in those situations, we just end up having to deal with it and, and figuring it out. And, you know, it, 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 I think it's less of an issue with a lot of the stuff I book than like a, a lot of the country stuff or things like that, for example, because, you know, when, well, also just a lot of that stuff in general, whether it's country or rock or anything that's going like more stadiums, arenas, stuff like that, $100 plus tickets, things like that the dollars are more limited. Um, I think that a lot of the fans of a lot of the stuff we work with, um, you know, they'll go to one, one show a week. Um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure that, uh, at AEG, you guys have seen zip reports and whatever, like looking through that. Yeah. Like for a lot of our stuff, I think we have a higher, like, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the, what the word is, but a higher rate of, you know, well, people the, return customers, I guess. Because the yeah. ticket price is lower and probably yeah. who the audience is, their ability to go to shows, they can go to shows more frequently um, based on the tic ticket price. Yeah. Where country yeah, the is not, doesn't really have a club touring level as much. Well, yeah, if you're, you know, if you've got a hundred bucks to spend and you're like, you know, a 35 year old wanting to go to a show that costs a hundred bucks, that's your only show that month, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an 18 year old and you've got a hundred bucks to spend, your parents are gonna let you spend a hundred bucks on shows and you can afford to go to three or four shows that month as a result, because the bands you wanna go see are in clubs and it's 25 bucks for a ticket. And you know, you're not spending 50 bucks on booze that night or whatever, then, you know, it's, it's like, um, it's a different thing. So I think it's also somewhat genre specific, but yeah. So, so I think that um, ultimately though, like we do always try to look at those routings and try to not be on top of each other, but sometimes it is a little bit unavoidable. And I would say that's where, I mean, even when I was in New Jersey uh, booking Starland Ballroom it with Dave, I mean, Dave, we would talk all the time of like, it's communication right? It's, it, that's the best thing, like the best lesson I ever learned in this industry was communication. And even as I held a calendar for a club, you know, Dave, you mentioned like less than Jake and Real Big Fish. If for whatever reason, I mean, I realized that they were routing and they were going to fall two days apart from each other. I would call both agents and be like, hey guys, I'm just giving you, you know, a little bit of heads up. You're going to fall right on top of each other. Is there a way to combine shows? Is there a way 
to do a multi-day ticket where we create an event out of it. Like it's, it's communicating with everybody and trying to be creative because again, there's, there's value, um, especially in these sort of career touring, you know, touring artists. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of times when that call happens too from a promoter that ends with the agent, the agents talking and sharing their routings. Cause then they're like, Oh shit, if we're apart on these two days, where else are we apart? And they realize maybe they're just intersecting at that one spot. Right. And maybe that's it. Or maybe their tours are paralleling each other for three weeks. And it's like, okay, now we've got a bigger problem. We got to reroute this tour. So that happens quite a bit as well. Um, but it is, you know, about communication and trying to figure that out. Yeah. I think we did have that. Didn't we Adam with blink and Lincoln park for a season for a summer, we were right on each other's heels everywhere we went. That wasn't good at all. Yeah. We had that with uh, yeah. Warp Tour and Paramore one year. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Paramore Fall Out Boy Tour. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. watching it from the outside and just being like, what are they doing to each other? They're just, you know, but. Yeah, I remember that well. Kevin, Kevin was happy. <laughs> so big takeaway for everybody. Communication, super important because, you know, these things are all happening before their public knowledge. And uh, especially within organizations, um, sharing information and what are people working on, I, I think is key. Um, mm -hmm. I remember when I was a talent buyer, when I was getting avails from venues, with, at the time, and this may have changed, I don't know, we, when I got the calendar, the avails calendar, I could see what artists were being held on certain dates. And then I know it changed a little bit more to just like, CAA is holding that date and we wouldn't know, you know who the artist was sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. So that I remember that being a way to kind of have some insight into what are the other things going on in the industry right now that uh, uh, that need to be taken into consideration. Yeah, um, it really is about communication, like Adam said, and and you really got to communicate across all all people involved because everyone's got different kind of agendas and like you know you gotta like you know like if you have. Um, I don't know, like an amphitheater tour going out and, um, you know, like maybe the promoter has another amphitheater tour going out around the same time and the tours aren't far apart. And the promoter doesn't really think that it's much of a conflict, but then you find out about the tour and you're like, what are you talking about? These bands toured together four years ago. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times the promoters may not have that visibility of like, the artistic direction the artists want to take because they're not the ones talking directly to the artists and like the ones that actually see some of those things and like the bands that these artists want to tour with so you know everyone really needs to talk and just know what's going on out there you know so pre-covid days <laughs> on the club level on the arena level how far out are tours kind of getting booked and routed these days I know that's going to vary uh, drastically depending. Yeah. But are you working six months in advance? Uh, are you working a year, two years in advance? It, it is somewhat dependent on the artist, but I'd say at this point, it's an average of like six to 12 months. And then there's some artists that will allow you to go further out, um, you know, depending on their situation. Some like to go further out, like one of the artists I work with, Parkway Drive, like they're always, they know what they want to do three years from now. And it's awesome. Cause like, you know, I've got their whole summer 2021 20, tour on hold. And even though we're in all this crazy craziness right now, like, you know, it's probably gonna, we're gonna figure stuff out, you know, like it makes it a lot easier because when you do have to pivot, you know, you're just pivoting instead of like, you know, be, just starting from Sorry. nowhere. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And, and obviously like for, for people like, Oh, did we just lose Jim? I'm, I'm sure he will come back. <laughs> I was literally just about to talk to ask him something. <laughs> I was going to ask him something too. So, but Adam country wise, what's, what's the time frame? I know when I was doing work tour and I was in all the Live Nation amphitheaters, they were already talking about, you know, I mean, the next summer. So at least a year, uh, 
it seemed like things were booking closer to a year out. Yeah, I mean, I would say that they're they're constantly. I mean, Country Works Weekend Warrior, which is a little bit different. Um, so they're looking at it pretty much a year in advance. You know, whatever. Kind of go back to what Dave was saying earlier, which is wherever they are this year they're playing here to plan for where they're going to be next year, whether it's going back into the amphitheaters, whether it's making a jump from a club to an arena, they're, they have purposes to why they're playing the market and how they're sort of moving forward from there. So it could be as much of a, as a year. Yeah. I think the other that was about to say before, uh, Jim, I think you got kicked off there for a minute. I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was about to say something, uh, to you. Uh, but you know, I think also like, you know, it depends on the size of the artist, right? Because like, you know, like the larger artists are gonna have bigger productions, right? And so as far as Jim's job goes, like it's very hard to do a job like his with not much lead time. And the, the other part to that is that they might be able to get it done, but how much more money is it gonna cost with less time, right? And so, you know, all those things I'm sure are things that he deals with and, you know, he, I'll let him speak to that, but, you know, I'd imagine that, I mean, you know, reserving lighting packages or whatever, like all that stuff's going to be harder and harder the less time you have. That was yeah, precisely I, what I was going to ask Jim is how far out do you even find out about tours and yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's two answers to that question. There's ideally, what does it feel like? <laughs> and then there's in real life, what is it? Uh, you know, I, the, a, a lot of, I think when the routing begins or when the agent begins to put the routing together, it depends sometimes on the artist's willingness to commit. And in, in some cases, uh, you know, uh, some of the artists I've worked with haven't wanted to commit to doing a tour for whatever reason until really late. And with an international artist, you know, there's, there's also that, there's also the difference between an artist that's relatively local you know, Jimmy Buffett, who rarely leaves the States or North America, um, versus a Lincoln Park, who's all over the globe. So you would hope that the all over the globe artist is going to give you long lead times. Um, sorry, I had a complete software crash here. Uh, is going to give you long lead times to get that kind of tour put together. But that's not always the case. Um, and in the case of Lincoln Park, you know, because the international component was so great, we were we had we built three copies of the gear. So we had an A, B, and a C rig, uh, and we were strategically placing those rigs, positioning those rigs around the globe, so that we wouldn't have to be flying heavy bits from you know Asia to Paris, from Paris to London, um, and we could we could preposition. I, I like having a routing, you know. I used to I'd be like many, I'm sure that I would get round up, wound up about not having the routing until it was already done um, and not being able to say things like, well, geez, we're going into Canada and back with no days in between. I, that, that can be problematic if days. Um, so uh, it's, it's more difficult as the production, as the execution team uh, that, to be those stakeholders and receive the routing that's done than it is obviously to have an opportunity to, to call out some things. But most of the agents you work with also know those issues, if you're lucky. Uh, and there's always other compelling factors <clears throat> from the other stakeholders, <clears throat> excuse me, about why, why you may be catching that unusual thing. If we can get, if we can pull it off and do the overnighter into Montreal, um, then we can get this big payday in Chicago on this routing. And you've got to, you've got to find a way to make those things work. You just hope it's not the first three shows of the tour. You, know, you try to make sure that that's at least given you halfway into the tour to get the systems together, right? So I think that that's the, the trade-offs is the thing that, uh, especially people that are just living the routing on the road that aren't in the position of production manager or don't have uh, really any background that are just showing up at the gig on the from the tour <clears throat> and going how do we get here today um, those trade-offs are I think the thing that's really the behind the curtain that people don't know about so right. um, what are some of those that you guys have to 
kind of decide between and it can be is it day of the week is it the venue you want to be in like what are some of the big things that you challenges that you have to make decisions between i, I can tell you from our side you know uh, lincoln's model was festivals in europe first and and you know we would chase the big payday festivals uh and and that may mean doing something like lisbon moscow berlin uh, because you're trying to fill the time between the weekend festivals as well. So you'd have to go hit a club somewhere. You'd have to go hit a downscaled show somewhere um, so that you're not, you know, five days or four days with everybody idle. So, we would, you know, one of the challenges for us in Europe was to get to this incredibly profitable festival run, we would have to do some really painful traveling. And if you understand, if the stakeholders have shared that information with you and then I with the team, then it makes more sense and it's less of a wind-up thing. And frankly, you know, the, the agents are just doing their job. They're maximizing the revenue on the tour. And it, it isn't until you have this kind of a dialogue that people can buy in and know, that, um, know why you're doing the ridiculous hops that you're doing. How about you, Dave? What are some um, trade-offs that you have to kind of debate between when you're putting together the, like, the nuances of the Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Jim really nailed it. You know, like it's, it's really about figuring out from the agent side on our side is how to maximize the fees for the artists, make it the most profitable, and, you know, communicating all that. Like, you know, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had the, hey, guys, like, do you want to do this drive? It's an overdrive. So it's going to cost you a few more bucks, but it's also going to make you a lot more than a few more bucks. So this is the situation. Um, you know, I've had bands where they literally will get like a skeleton crew to like go to a festival while the rest of the band and crew go to a show on the way. Right. And then they meet up with the skeleton crew at the festival the next day. So that yeah. that skeleton crew is already setting up production on, on, on site. You know, all that stuff. I'm sure Jim's done that yeah, stuff a million times. There's, a, there's an advanced motor package out there in front, or in our case, there was a second set of gear and an advanced team out there getting that gear set up. So we could do a, a land and play. And the other thing is, you know, now that when you know that that's your model, you can, you can uh, do the, the value management on that from, from a financial standpoint and, and do, the, do the math and show the agent and show the manager, listen, you can capture that really unusual play that's got a big price tag to it. And here's the math on what the extra seats on the plane are going to cost, the extra rigging. And if, if you're only going to earn an extra $10,000 by doing it, but you're going to spend 30 to get there, obviously, what's the point? Uh, and, and, and I think, at least on our side with uh, uh, Michael Arfin, you know, we were able to, and, and Scott Thomas, we were able to bring those conversations together and, and be, we learned, you know, lessons learned, of course, the hard way. We learned to communicate those things before the routing got booked and, and could demonstrate this is a really profitable move. It's going to suck. It's going to be painful, but it's really profitable. Let's go do it. Yeah, and some, sometimes it's also out of our control. Like sometimes it's an avails issue. Venue's not available when we need it. You know, you know, you know if you're in arenas, you're dealing with uh, sporting events and, you know, getting priority on that stuff and things like that. You know, I mean, I'm sure Adam and I have even had the conversation when he was at Starland where he maybe got a call for a show he really wanted. And I already had a confirmed show that wasn't announced. And he called me and said, hey, can you move to the next day so I can do both shows? And I'm like, yeah, but it's going to be an overdrive. You got an extra 3,500 bucks in the deal, you know, and then you can have both shows. We've had that conversation. You know, those things happen too. And then you go to the band and say, well, it's going to cost you a $500 overdrive, but you're going to make 3500 you know, for a club play, something, you know, like for whatever example. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah. So over here, I've just, uh, the vocabulary on that is it costs more when uh, drivers, you might have to bring in a second driver or there's, you know, accommodations made for when you, a driver has to drive further than uh, the number of miles uh, or the, hours there there used to be accommodations made for that <laughs> and i yeah actually this is a good time to mention the electronic <laughs> driving logs yeah um, 
I got my, uh, I got my, the layman's version. I went to the website for like the DOT or whatever to try to get like, what is the current like rules? And, and it was just like, oh my God, I'm just going to text my trucker friend. Okay. So he says since 2017, they have been implementing the ELDs, electronic driver logs. In 2018, uh -huh. they passed a law where your device is attached to your truck or bus. And once the vehicle moves, it starts logging time. Depending on the state rules you follow, you can drive for 11 hours with a half hour break before eight hours. Oh, you have to take a break before eight hours, but you can drive for 11 hours. You must be off duty for an hour before you sleep and then you sleep for eight hours and then you have another hour before you start driving. So basically you, have, you can drive for 11 hours, but you have to take a break during it. And then uh, you have to be off for 10 hours before you can drive again. So this well, is a relatively new thing right how is this affecting well that that also didn't address the miles which is a huge part of it um so like zero to 450 miles is considered just an, a normal drive mm -hmm. and 450 to 550 is an overdrive 550 to 630 is a double overdrive 630 and above is illegal and you either need to have a second driver or fly or do whatever else so you know, those are, yeah, those are the rules that have been in play for a bit now. So, you know, yeah. And so as agents, we're constantly looking at that, you know, like checking all the mileage as we route the tours and figuring out all those things to maximize cost, you know, or maximize profitability, I should say. And on the promoter side, if you're do if you're working on global touring, you're working on uh, buying full tours. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, how involved are you in um, those tour costs and decisions that are um, kind of fall more on the artist side than the promoter side? I think it depends. It really depends on the artist, the manager, um, the agent. There are some managers and agents that like to maintain complete control and don't really care or want to know what we have to say. Um, there's others that ask every question of us and ones that you know, even before the tour, go, most even before the tour goes on sale, we're having conversations with the production manager about what their designs look like, obviously, so we can hold uh, the proper seat kills and, and all of that. But, um, you know, I, for us, I would say we appreciate being involved more with it because as someone who looks at it as a partner of the tour, um, we're here, as Dave said, to maximize the profitability for the artist. So if our two cents about maybe we know um, that the that we're going to go from Indianapolis to Chicago, but the docks, uh, it's only two docks in Chicago, so the loading is going to be really rough. Um, and we so we don't really want to do that because of the drive time or whatever it is like, we try to have all of those conversations. Uh, by the way, that was a really bad example, because it's a really short drive. Um, but <laughs> we try to be as involved in those conversations as we can be, because that's where I feel we have value, right? We have value because we have guys that are on the road well before working at AG, and then they're on the road with multiple tours hitting these buildings and they have, all, they know all those little nuances the, about um, whether it's, you know, what the grid looks like up in the air versus what the dock is like in the backstage areas are like to help us properly plan for the tour. So um, we try to be involved as much as we can. That's, the, that's always the thing too, right? The, the more the whole team, the team as a whole is working from the beginning, the easier everybody's life becomes, right? That's always a miss, I think, sometimes if a manager's not making, forcing the stakeholders to communicate, you the booking agent, you the manager, you the production manager, you the tour manager, you're all going to develop the charter for this tour, um, you know, start talking as soon as you know you're going to do it. And it's unfortunate that we don't always get that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. It can only benefit the tour. It only benefits the artist. It only benefits the bottom line for us to be. Talking. I realized years ago when I, was, when I was at Starland, we had an artist that come, came through. And I remember the singer looked to his tour manager and he's like, we're leaving half our production on the truck. Why are we paying for this production? Exactly. And ultimately it goes right back to the agent who says, well, we didn't know what you were carrying and we didn't vet it with the venue. So unfortunately you're paying $5,000 to have this stuff sit on the truck tonight. So the more 
conversations that you can have in advance, the better, you know, it's yeah, and, kind of a circle, but it's, the, you know, the it, more that we're talking in advance, the better it is. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, look, I get that it's a cost saving measure probably to keep as much staff off payroll until it's time to go because there's no revenue happening. But at the same time, you leave that gear in the truck or you've got your, you produce an unha unhappy artist, then to what expense was it really worth it? Keep everybody out of it. It's, you know, it, I, th I think the conversation goes back to what's the vision, like the agent, manager, production side, tour manager should all know what the vision is from the as well if the artist is the one creating it. And then everybody can march in lock, lock step after that to make it happen. Sorry, that's me. That's my pulpit over. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. It's good. <laughs> no, <you don't. laughs> um, well, why don't we move into our uh, current situation a little bit? What is, I mean, we, nobody knows. Here's the challenge for me at personally on like all fronts is uh, there's not going to be a national consistent timing on when things are going to be able to happen. Um, actually, at the beginning of jumping into this, Jim, why don't you uh, give a little pitch for your event safety guide uh, thing? Yeah. What, you guys put together a thing. Oh, no, I'm losing. Well word. described. You put together a thing, and uh, I recently shared about it, and I intend to read the actual document. Did really, you, Tell us did about you, it. Did you, Twitter, did you Twitter book it? I, I don't Twitter anything. Uh, so for those who may not know, there's an organization called a nonprofit organization called the Event Safety Alliance. And you can find out about that eventsafetyalliance.org. Uh, it's been around since the unfortunate stage collapse in Indiana um, as a nonprofit uh, intended to create, uh, co collect together and disseminate information about safety and live events. Um, one of the unspoken truths about our business is there's no barrier to entry, zero barrier to entry. Anybody can go produce a show. So the Event Safety Alliance came about with the idea that perhaps there should be some small barriers to entry and that safety should be a principal topic in everything that we do. Jump to COVID. Uh, as soon as it became apparent what COVID meant and what it was going to do to our industry, decimate us. Uh, we also recognized the Event Safety Alliance that a, a reasoned, reasonable measured approach to come back to work and keeping both customers and artists and those who work behind the scenes safe um, is absolutely integral in making sure that we don't mess it up and send us back into quarantine again for some extended period of time, as has just happened in South Korea. Uh, so. Um, the ESA Vice President Steve Edelman, Director of Operations Jacob Warwick, have assembled uh, along with a team of 300 uh, plus uh, subject matter experts, a guide to reopening, the Event Safety Alliance reopening guide. Uh, you can find it at the website. Um, and it, it's been distributed widely among around the world and it is, uh, you know, principles in reasonable best practices to get if you're going to have to produce a show, large or small, right now or at any period in time between now and the time we go back to something that resembled what we were before, here are the reasonable practices you might want to implement to ensure you don't do the industry any harm. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Free of charge. <laughs> what, are the, um, what are the discussions that are happening what are the discussions happening now? Timing wise, what are, what are people trying to do? Dave. Well, um, like I said at the beginning, no one actually knows, not one person. If any, if any person says to you, we're doing a show on this date, or this is when the first tour is gonna happen, they are lying, they have no clue. Not one person on the planet has any actual idea so what I will tell you is how I personally have interpreted the facts and that is to take or to leave or what have you. Um, my personal opinion after interpreting all the facts and my personal opinion is also changing by the minute as I see more facts, but uh, 
<clears throat> my belief is that this started off very much as a health issue. And now that we've started the slow process of opening back up, it's become more of a political discussion. <laughs> and so like I've been talking to some of my artists about when we can get back on the road. Um, personally, I don't think any tours will happen till 2021. If anything happens in 2020, it'll be very spotty at best. But I've been telling artists like, like I wouldn't be surprised if you could do like a red state tour before you could do an actual tour because it has like, and I say that like half joking, but really not because like, you know, the red states are going to open before the blue. That's just, that's just the facts. So, you know, if bands really want a tour, do we go and put a routing together where when it gets to the blue states, we just drive straight through? Like, maybe, I don't know. You know, um, do we have venues that are cut in half in terms of capacity? And if so, can they even survive? Like, are they, are they better off not opening than opening at half capacity? Like, you know, because it doesn't change these, and Adam can speak to this better than I can being on the promoter side, but like, you know, their expenses don't change that dramatically by cutting the capacity in half. There's a couple variable expenses, but you know, not a lot. I mean, they're still going to have some very hard expenses with half the money to work with. And the bands are still going to need a certain amount of money to, to tour. So how is there even enough money to go around then? So so I guess the point I'm making there is, you know, if they say in four months, hey, everyone can open at half capacity, does that really mean we're open at all? I don't know. Um, yeah. Maybe not. Uh, you know, m maybe some places can, some places can't. I, I, I just don't know. Um, so I think it's a wait and see. What, what I've been doing with my artists, what I've been telling them is we've been just rebooking the tours. You know, um, and, and the biggest focus has been on the postponements, not on the new tours. Because, you know, like, what I've been telling my artists that want to put new tours up is, do you guys really want to go up in a time when no one has money against all these tours that already have all the money in the bank versus your new tour just starting from scratch with no money out there to buy tickets with a, you know, brutal economy? So... So what we've really been focusing on the postponements and the rescheduled dates. And I am now on an, on an average of four. The, m most of my tours have now been rerouted and reconfirmed an average of four times. Um, so when I say average, there's some that's been two or three. There's a couple that have been five times. And, you know, I've had a few artists say to me, hey, like, at what point do we just, like, hit pause and just sit here and wait? And my advice is always, listen, like, I'm the one doing more work here, not you. I think we have to keep rebooking it. And I don't mind doing that work because at some point when we rebook it, it will be the final rebooking. When? I don't know. But, you know, the tour that, you know, was, had 15 dates left when this all happened, that was in the middle of the tour in March, that the day after it happened, we moved the tour to May and, announced it and then a week later we were moving it to July and then two weeks later we were moving it to October and now it's 2021 and you know like at some point that last booking will will happen last. and the tour will pay it play out I mean th th there's no way we don't ever have shows again right so um so I would rather do the work than be the last to kind of get to the venues and get the venue avails and be competing with all the other tours that have just gone back on sale and so on and so forth. So it's a pain in the ass. We're doing five times the amount of work for zero times the amount of money. So uh, <laughs> we used to book a tour once and make a living once. And now we book a tour five times and we get zero revenue, but that's that. That's it right now. That's the world. Dave, do you think that there's going to be so many artists going back at the same time, like a shotgun start? Do you think it's going to be impossible to, to cultivate the audience need 
there because it, we're going to be flooded. I think that's going to be a thing. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I think, and, and that goes to the point I was making about, you know, trying not to do too much with new tours and really focusing more okay. on the rescheduled because the one thing that's really encouraging is that the refund rate, and again, Adam can probably speak to this better than I can, but, um, but I know at least speaking for my tours personally and the conversations I've been having with Lime Nation and AEG and Ticketmaster, the refund rates are pretty low. People still want to go to these shows. They, uh, they prefer to keep their money in the hands of Ticketmaster and hold on to their ticket than ask for a refund. We are seeing that on a lot of these tours. And that's good news. But again, what I've been telling my artists is it's a lot easier to convince a fan to not get money back that they've already spent than it is to convince a fan to spend money that they haven't money. yet spent, right? Right, right. That's a much harder sell, especially with 36 million people unemployed, and right? Also, so like, I had a conversation today with a manager who, same situation, we rerouted this thing four times. We were on the road. We then moved. We thought we were great. We moved to May. Then we moved to July. Now we're going to move to 21. And they were like, well, should we just cancel the whole thing, refund everybody, and just like restart when things are right? And I'm like, you've got money in the bank that no nobody else has that right now. Like, why would you be so quick to get, like, if your intention is to play, we just need to continue doing the work to until we get to the time that we're going to play. But yeah. I don't like money in the bank right now means a lot, right? Because other, like, like you said, it's going to be a lot harder to convince somebody in the new world to spend money on a ticket. One, when they, the economy is what it is. And then two, as you shotgun out of this and there's going to be so much traffic out there, um, there's right. just going to be, mm -hmm. you're going to be competing with so much. And, yeah. definitely, and I'd ask Dave, I'd ask another question of you, which is, and, and I would say a lot of the artists that you're working with of like, I don't know if there's going to be a world for the, you know, bus and trailer tour, right? The one bus and trailer kind of thing. Like there, it was such a pre COVID that was such a booming business. I would say every artist that had a song on radio or had X amount of hundred thousand streams or whatever it is, was in a bus and a trailer and went, how much is that going to exist after this? You know, is, or are those artists going to have to, suck it up and be support or package creatively or you know whatever it is is that well, going to be the same yeah i think all artists are going to really need to make sacrifices right because you know like for example in jim's world you know if we lower all these capacities and have to take all these safety measures which we're going to have to do right um you know the first place you can cut expenses is production Right. And I don't say that to be discouraging I to Jim's. I get it. I sure mean, though. you know, like, yeah, like, like I said, I just mentioned I'm booking five tours for zero money. So we're, we're all in the same boat right. Right. Um, or booking right. a, one tour five times. But, you know, um, but that's that's like the first place. Right. So, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're a stadium act or a club act like that's that's a variable expense right? You know, there, there are certain expenses that they can't live without. They can't get on stage without a guitar tech, right? Like, you know, there, there's things like that that you just need. But production, figuring out, okay, like, how do we scale back production and still put together a great show? Like, I, without knowing, you know, um, all of Jim's clients personally, I do have a bunch of friends in the Lincoln Park camp and stuff, but like, you know, I'd imagine he's going to get a lot of the calls people asking him to pull a rabbit out of a hat being like, Hey, we really want to have this great production, but it's going to need to be at this lower budget that we haven't like, we've, we haven't talked about a budget this low for production since 2008. And you know, what can we do? And you know, that's people are going to start getting creative and those calls are going to happen a lot. And so to Adam's point on like the and club, I you know, the Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. You had a oh, point you were uh, So I just say, yeah, to Adam's point about like, you know, the, the bus and trailer band and, you know, th those things are going to have to come into play too. Like, you know, what do those bands do? Do they go from 
you know, starting their career, getting to that point in their career where they're starting to bring production and all those things. And then having to go back to just using the house lighting um, well, or things like that, or, you know, but how do they put a show on still that, you know, is exciting to the fans and different and unique. And that unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the, the cream of the crop is going to stand out, you know, in that, right? Because there's some bands that can just put on a damn good show without even a single light flashing, you know? And there's others that need the light flashing to distract you from their plane. I and mean, that's just the reality. We all know those bands. Well, like, yeah. you know, I, I, um, like, I, yeah, I, I'm a huge Blink-182 fan, but anyone that said they're a good live band, like, has never actually paid attention to them playing, right? Like, you know, yeah. like, I think they would tell you that, right? Like, that's just, you know, that's, that's the reality. Like, if they don't tell jokes and don't have a big production, like, their, their show is going to be fucking awful, right? Like, so every band's kind of a little bit different. And, um, but... But, you know, the other thing is people are going to have to scale back capacities, which also, again, means scaling back expectations on how they tour. You know, if you're a band that typically sold 2,500 tickets a night with the economy, what it is, you may now be a 1,500 ticket a night act. And what does that yeah. do to your budgets? And so everyone's going to have to really, um, well, you know, adjust their expectations going into tours. I would argue that all of that is correct, but I would argue that the entire ecosystem is being punished right now, right? The whole ecosystem is is in the same place as the artists, as the crews, in that none of the equipment's working. So this won't be popular among the designers in the world, but geez, wouldn't it be great if we could use the stuff that's already on the shelves and not have to use the stuff that hasn't been produced yet that nobody has that we got to carry in airplanes around the world? I think that mm -hmm. the, the vendors themselves would much rather have the designers ask for the equipment that's on the shelf than force, you know, a lighting company to go buy new lighting fixtures that nobody's ever heard of before. So, I, again, back to the whole idea of a unified front with the manager and the, and the touring side and the agent, we recognize it isn't going to be the same when we come back. And we recognize that in order to get back, We've got to scale back, and that means, you know, maybe less less production. Maybe the music has to be better. Sounds like a win, but I think, uh, I think what we what we need to do going back into this is, yeah, a lot of venues. People aren't going to care whether you've got the big production after COVID. People are just going to want to get the hell out of the house. So I think we yeah. need to put ourselves in that mind. It's not going to matter if you've got the biggest show on the planet. Don't do that to yourselves and don't do that to the industry because I think mm -hmm. we have to be reasonable, right? We've got to come back reasonably. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of artists will be because they're going to have gone a, a year without making any money too, <laughs> you That's know, right. like, so <clears throat> they're going to, they're going to have to pay their bills too. And everyone's going to be in the same boat together. I think similar to what Dave said, it's going to be a lot of people playing perhaps in the territory they live in versus going on a full U.S. tour if it's a state that's open. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of people carrying less production and figuring out how to trim, for lack of better terms, trim the fat. You know, I think that when we, as we went into this, I mean, the first things that we heard before we heard of management companies and promoters and agencies laying people off, you heard, hey, band furloughed or laid off their crew, or they let go of their band if they were a singer. You know, those were the first things that went. And I think that yeah. they're spending this time to figure out what their real necessary costs are. Um, it's just it's just reality of the world that we're in right now. I think, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important everybody takes a deep breath and recognizes that, you know, we're going to come back, but we're, it won't be the same. And we'll get to, we'll get the big stuff. But for now, let's just get working again, right? That's what yeah. everybody should be thinking about. I wish that we yeah. would have, I mean, none of us could have seen the future. I wish that our industry would have closed for like four weeks. You know, like when this started in mid-March that we would have just been like, everybody stop guessing and go like, go sit at home and enjoy some time at home. And let's pick this up again in April or May or whenever it is. Yeah. And we have a clear picture of what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, would have been a lot more fun than rebooking tours that weren't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I was but. so proud of my reroutes though, you know? I know. 
I know. Um, so we had a um, this is cool. I've never seen this. Oh, good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. okay. Can, can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. My internet sometimes is spotty. I don't know why. I live in a great, like, normal urban place that should have good internet, but it goes out. <laughs> so we got a question come in from Maddie, which I'm going to just kind of paraphrase. So if a tour gets uh, canceled or rescheduled, you have to refund customers who lose money. So uh, the, uh, the question... I think really that she's going on to say is, um, have you already spent money on the production? So for tours that you did have scheduled that got canceled or postponed, has money gone that did not end up on the road yet, that, got, uh, that was not rolling yet, how much actually got spent, to, uh, paid out to your vendors and to whoever, and do you get any of that back? on the or the refunds on the deposits you put down on your trucking uh deal or anything the, all, you know all speaking for myself <laughs> yeah we i mean i think and i can probably speak for adam and, and jim on this too but you know we've had bands in in all phases when this happened right we had bands i had one band that was on a sold out tour but they were only three days in Obviously, all production was paid for, bus deposits, truck deposits, blah, 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 blah. They weren't getting that back. Like, you know, I mean, they were, of course, going to be able to get maybe some partial refunds and things like that. But, they, they, but you know, if, if you look at a tour budget, it's not the beginning of the tour that makes the band money, right? Like, it's, it's those last X amount of dates that make the band money. So bands like that got really hit hard, you know? And then we've had bands... On the flip side, I had one band that literally told me we were going to start making profit tomorrow. They had like seven days left on the tour. They were like, our last seven days were where our profit kicked in. And they're like, so at least we broke even. We did break even on this tour, but we didn't make a dime. They were on the road for three weeks, you know, and, and that was that. And then, you know, we had bands in between. We had bands that weren't going out for a month, had to spend some money, were able to get some, you know, uh, deposits refunded, things like that. I, I'd say it's all the above. Just really depends on where you were in the process and how reasonable the people you deal with are. But I think, I think being that everyone was in the same boat, I think everyone's been pretty reasonable to each other in terms of dealing with this stuff. I think on, yeah, I agree. And I think on our end, you know, when you go back to over the last, I'd say four weeks, the, the refund issue has been such a hot topic because the truth is what this exposed, not in a negative way, was sort of the, the flow of money within our industry and how that works. And it's true that once a ticket is purchased, that money is spent four times over. That money is spent by the promoter to pay the deposit for the artist. It's spent by the venue to pay for their staff, their day-to-day -day staff. And it's paid for by the artist to maintain their salaries, maintain their production and whatever else. So that ticket has been broken up so many ways that nobody really has the money at this point, right? And that's what took so long for the industry to figure out how to go in reverse. Um, it's been interesting, but, you know, I think that, again, as Dave said, moving forward, the, that'll probably all change, you know, where, how the flow of money is, because if we ever found ourselves in this situation again, I don't think we can take um, how long what we did now, you know, to react and to understand, because I don't think that every aspect of the industry understood kind of, how everybody has spent the $15 that you spent has been broken up between 15 different people. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, it's true. Lots of, lots of, this is sort of off topic. Lots of people are asking questions about what do uh, booking agents look for when they're signing artists, what do talent buyers look for? And I just want to tell everybody we will do future workshops on those exact things. And hopefully I will have uh, these guys back again on those topics, so um, I didn't want people to feel like we weren't addressing their questions. Um, I like this one about the drive-in movie theater, though. What's your take on those shows, guys? Yeah, I was going to. Sorry. Yeah. I'm on the Let's financial see. model, I've, I mean, we've everybody is running the financial model. I, I think that it depends on what you consider a, a live entertainment experience. If you want to do it right, I think it's not cost efficient, right? If you want to give an A-level event with an artist 
Um, there's nobody's making money off of it. It's going to cost more than you can possibly, you know, at the end of the day, you're capped at four or 500 cars, whatever it is. Right. There are artists that are out there doing it. And I think that, I hope they don't, but I, I do think that there is a chance that they'll, it's a bad representation of what live entertainment is or can be, right? Um, people miss it now. People miss the world that we had before. Um, I just, I think if, we, if anyone's going to do it, they just need to do it to a specific level. Um, versus, well, it seems, specific like, it purpose, would, maybe. It seems like it would aim at a very particular audience. So uh, I was having a conversation about this with some other people yesterday, like something like Ravinia in Chicago, where I've been there twice and I've never even seen the stage because it's all about this like lawn picnic experience where you know they have the uh the orchestras are playing there the there and it's you know an audience that wants to hear the live music but isn't as focused on seeing it happen on stage um you know for a, a demographic that wants to sit down rather than a very active audience like what are the possibilities of and it's possible but it doesn't seem like it is would make sense to do a tour that way mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, ultimately, as agents, we work for the artists. And if our artists end up wanting to do some of those, we're going to we're going to work on them for them, you know, and help them make it happen. But I don't really love it. I don't think that it's a sustainable model. I think that to Adam's point, it makes no financial sense because, you know, like, I don't know where you could do it where you don't have to build an infrastructure for it. Like, I don't know where you can do it that already has a stage and bathrooms and all the electricity and everything else that you need. Like, to me, it seems like you're kind of, you know, having to build like a festival grounds or a new venue with very limited, uh, you know, gross potential with only being able to fit however many cars. And then like sight lines are going to be, crappy if you're not like in the first what couple rows of cars and honestly for me personally and again if bands we work with want to do these we're, we're going to figure out how to make it work for me personally if i'm going to like listen to music in the car i'll just listen to the fucking record <laughs> i mean and that was the yeah. cover same i mean we've had artists ask about it and we've explored it and you know but the reality is i, I talked to a friend as i was going through the motion and who's not in our industry. And I was like, would you go? And they were like, well, how's the music amplified? And I'm like, well, it's through your car stereo or an app or whatever it is. And they're like, that, that's not a concert. That's me listening to the music in my car. You know, it's just not, it's not the same. And for what you yeah, have- Yeah, just lesser charge, quality. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. And I think there's other creative ways. I think that driving got popularity um, because of a few articles that came out. I think that there's other creative things that you can do to sustain during this time. No one's gonna get rich off of any of them. Um, which is fine. It's all about sustaining right now. But I think that there are people out there that are getting incredibly creative in ways to um, do things with artists during this time. That's not just, you know, live streaming and, and whatever else. And it's just going to take a minute to vet and for things to get out there. But um, I don't think that we're getting on the road anytime soon. So we've got time. No, and I think the other thing that we haven't talked about with respect to, you know, even if we were, it's what about the airports? What about the buses? What about the artists' reluctance to get into any of those things? What about the crew's reluctance to get into any of those things, even though we're all desperate for work? Um, you know, there's all of those ancillary factors that tie into whether or not we, we can. Yeah, we might be able to, but are we willing to is the other problem. And the audience has to want to. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, um, there's this event called Shiprocked which maybe you guys are familiar with. It's a, uh, you know, big cruise ship that brings rock bands and like battle bands and stuff every year. And they just announced and put next year's ship rocked on sale. And we got a bunch of offers here at our agency for, for the, you know, for the event. And uh, we, we usually have a few bands there every year. And this year, you know, we, we had some different, responses from artists which was you know we, we had some artists that were like yeah after the pandemic i don't think i want to go be stuck on a ship with thousands of people that just seems like a stupid idea right and then we have other artists that are like yeah we're all in but the most interesting part about it because they booked the ship for next year before the pandemic 
it's actually a bigger ship than they've ever had before. And it's already almost sold out and they haven't even announced the lineup. So again, encouraging that fans seem to really want to get out and are like, Hey, like we got to get past this. Like we want to get back to having fun and seeing music. There's an event we've been talking about a lot internally called Gulf Coast Jam in Pensacola, uh, Florida, Labor Day weekend of this year that announced they went on sale last week and I was told they went on sale first weekend with 7,000 tickets. And this event is like in two, this whatever, Labor Day. This Labor Day. Um, went on wow. sale. It's on the beach uh, in Pensacola. It's Luke Bryan and Leonard Skinner and Brad Paisley and they have said the event is going to happen. They went on sale, but I don't think it will happen. That's just me. But um, the, to me, the interesting point was the fact that they sold 7,000 tickets first weekend. There's yeah. people that yeah. want to go, believe that they'll be able to go, you know? Um, if, that, if it were to happen, Florida yeah. would be the place. <laughs> <laughs> I've already, I've been, looking, I've been looking at Florida. Florida. Yeah. <laughs> But to go back to what Dave said too, about refunds, it is true. I mean, most of our tours, we're seeing between five and 8% refunds right now, um, which is nothing uh, compare, you know, comparative to what we expected, um, which means that people believe we're gonna come back and people wanna go to shows. So, I mean, there's, that's, I think that's also why it waited a little bit on the refund, you know, in addition to figuring out the process was, you didn't really wanna start the process at the beginning of bad news. When the whole world is negative, people are going to be quick to react and say, we just want our money back. This is never going to end. I think now, as you start to see states open up, as you start to see some more positive news in the world, um, people are encouraged that we will get back to concerts. I'm not, but people are. Yeah, I, I, also think, I, I, I think there's a couple of factors to people holding on. It's, it's, it's money spent, as Dave said, and, and it, you know, that's a big one. But the other one is it's, the hope in some way you're holding on to hope with that ticket that that show is going to happen and you're going to will it to happen because you haven't asked for a refund on your ticket. I mean, that would be me for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I think, I'm curious to see what happens with refunds when we get to the point that the shows will actually happen. Like we can all go, Oh yes. When that gets rescheduled in the future, I'm sure the world is going to be great and I'll be able to go to this show. So I'm going to hold on to that hope. But when we actually get close to that happening, I think that um, certainly it'll be interesting to see if people go, eh, yeah, the show's happening, but I don't feel comfortable going to it. And well, just, well, yeah, it is. So let's say today we announced a rescheduled date. You only have 30 days to get a refund. So you're making a decision. Right. Now. You're not holding on to your money. Um, Ticketmaster, Live Nation, AAG all change their policies to still allow refunds, but you have a 30, similar to buying a t-shirt at the Gap. You've got a 30 day window to return it. If you choose not to at that point, you're left with it. Our hope and our expectation is that when the dates are announced and refunds are available we're, is when we're seeing the huge, you know, rush for the refund so our percentages right now mind you we haven't gotten past the 30-day window on any tour we are still in that low percentage but i don't think that fans have like a little 30-day ticker and they're waiting till day 28 to decide if they're gonna refund the ticket or not you have to think that the majority of them ran to, to return their ticket the ones that wanted or believe they were going yeah to. i agree i think but what will be interesting is what the drop counts look like when the shows actually play versus the ticket sales yeah. For sure. That, that who knows? I, I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm not, I'm not saying it will be bad or good. I'm just saying that'll be interesting to see. So drop count for people that don't know, know is the number of people that actually attend a show back when hard tickets were a thing and they were ripped in half. The stub was dropped into a box. Somebody would count all of the stubs and that is how many people actually attended the show. Um, I think that that will be interesting because I don't think that there's going to be a strong secondary market for ticket resale. Um, so if people have missed the refund period, they might just and decide they're not going, they might, they're just out the money. Um, and the drop count will actually tell us how many people actually showed up for the shows. That'll be really interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, kind of thoughts, anything that you feel like, uh, you want to throw in an ad? We're kind of coming up close to an hour and a half. Time has flown by. <laughs> this has been so much fun, but, uh, Kind of final thoughts on routing the, the future, any of that stuff? 
That's been awesome. Thanks for putting this together, Jen. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. It's good to yeah. make use of our time like this. <laughs> well, yeah. I hope all three of you will join me again. It is a pleasure to see all of your faces. And um, you guys too. You know, I, re I respect you guys very much and, and really uh, thankful that you took the time to share your knowledge and expertise. And um, this will be up on YouTube probably tomorrow ish. So uh, anybody um, that wants to share this and pass it along out there, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, any last minute questions from any attendees? I mean, Maddie, you still have your hand up. Do you want your hand to be up? <laughs> well, she said her hand up for a while. She said, I don't know if she took it down or not. So you know what? I'm going to bring. She's good. Um, I'm going to bring. Oh, she says no thanks. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Uh, and take care and be well. And Dave, uh, especially, I hope that we get a, a, a negative test result on you. So. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Thanks so much. And uh, great seeing all you guys and have a good one. So good to meet you guys. Thank you. Jen, you're awesome. Yeah, you Thank too. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.